We begin now in James chapter 5. And one of the things we notice is the very dramatic beginning to this chapter. Let me read to you the first three verses. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. We read those first three verses of James chapter 5, and we just sort of go back a little bit, go, wow, where did this come from? What's the context for this? When did James start talking about the rich and all of that? Well, again, we remind ourselves that the tone and the structure of James's letter to the early Christians and to us, because he speaks by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to us here today, that the tone and the structure of this letter is very much like the Old Testament book of Proverbs. James is stringing together pearls of practical wisdom and an explanation of what it means to have a living faith. Not a dead faith, but a living faith. And so he's speaking very much to practical action and attitude in the Christian life. Now, where does he come up with this idea of confronting the oppressive rich? Well, he does it, I think, probably because where we left off in James chapter 4, he was really stressing the idea of humility before God. And, let's face it, uh, sometimes those who have a lot of material things in this world, wealthy people, the rich, if you want to call it that, although I I don't know if I've ever met anybody who considers themselves rich, even though by the standards by which we live today, every one of us is rich compared to anybody in the ancient world. But putting all that aside, When we think about uh, this in the present world today, we understand that people who have a lot of material resources, those who we might consider to be rich, it's easy for them to have a greater problem with humility. And so maybe that's where James connects one pearl to another pearl on this necklace of beautiful wisdom that he gives us from the Holy Spirit of God. In any regard, we can understand these words clear enough. Look now again at verse 1. He says, Come now, you rich weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Why? Well, he explains more in verse 2, because your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Now verse 3, your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. So again, after developing the idea of a complete dependence upon God, a humble dependence on God, now he's confronting those who perhaps might have the most intense temptation to live independently from God, the rich, the wealthy. Now, let's remind ourselves of something. It's not a sin to be rich. Jesus counted some rich persons among his followers. Zacchaeus was a rich man, but... Uh, he was a follower of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man, but he was a follower of Jesus. Barnabas in the book of Acts was a rich man, but he was a follower of Jesus. So we understand riches do not mean that a person cannot be a believer or a true follower of Jesus. But we also recognize this, that wealth in this world presents an obstacle, a hindrance to the kingdom of God. Isn't that what Jesus explained in Matthew chapter 19? Isn't that what Jesus explained when he had that encounter with the rich young ruler? That man who apparently was so given over to the focus upon and the the love of riches that Jesus demanded of that particular man that he sell everything and give it to the poor and then go follow Jesus. You see, we know that having a lot in this world can make our hearts wedded, maybe even welded to this world. And so it's true that riches and wealth are a obstacle to the kingdom. Now, we thank the Lord that it is an obstacle that, under the work of the Spirit of God, can be overcome, but it is an obstacle nevertheless. Now, it's also true, according to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, that the pursuit of riches is a motivation for every conceivable sin. That's what Paul meant when he wrote in 1 Timothy 6.10, that money is the root of all kinds of evil. In other words, there is not a single sin that you can think of that somebody will not commit for the sake of money and wealth. 
And so the, the simple idea here is here is a challenge for believers who have a lot in this present world. But, but I do like what Matthew Poole, the old Puritan commentator, said on this point. He said this, quote, He speaks to them not simply as rich, for riches and grace sometimes may go together, but as wicked, not only wallowing in wealth, but abusing it to pride, luxury, oppression, and cruelty. I think that's a good word from Matthew Poole. So what does he say to those people whose uh, heart is welded to this world because of their riches? He tells them, look at there in verse 1, weep and howl. I love this. It's very much the style of an Old Testament prophet. James is telling the rich to mourn in consideration of their destiny. Did you see the destiny there? The destiny is, again, he says, for your miseries that are coming upon you in verse 1, your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are corroded. Now, I can just imagine somebody who first heard James or heard this letter read in a church, some wealthy man in an early Christian congregation, he thinks to himself, my riches aren't corroded, my my garments are not moth-eaten, my gold and silver are not uh, gone, they're not corrupted. What's going on with this? What are you saying that these things already? James is speaking of the certainty of coming judgment upon the wicked wealthy, and it's as if that judgment has already come. By the way, it's kind of interesting here. In verse 2, James is probably referring to the destruction of three kinds of wealth. Stores of food are corrupted or rotted. Think of mold infesting, you know, piles of grain. Secondly, garments are moth-eaten and no good anymore. And then thirdly, gold and silver are corroded. Each one of them comes to nothing in their own way. And so James says, consider that if God's judgment is to come upon these things, then consider how you need to get your heart right with him right now. I mean, think about it. When he says in verse 1, weep and howl, is it a good thing or a bad thing for somebody to weep and howl over coming judgment? Well, listen, it's a good thing if somebody weeps and howls over coming judgment now so that they can prepare their hearts for that judgment to come. Again, let me quote to you another Puritan commentator, John Trapp. He says this, Better to weep here where there are wiping handkerchiefs in the hand of Christ than to have your eyes whipped out in hell. Better howl with men now than yell with devils later. Well, you got to admit, John Trapp has a certain expressive way of speaking. Better to howl with men now than to yell with devils later. Absolutely it is. Sorrow over our sin, sorrow and concern over coming judgment right now is a good thing. And if we fail to do this, if we fail to respond properly, look what it says in verse 3. It says there that these things will be a witness against you. You see, the corruptible, perishing nature of wealth is a witness against us. On the day of judgment, it will be revealed if whether or not we have lived our lives in an arrogant independence. That's what James is condemning. Those who heap up treasure in the last days, when instead, what should we be doing? We should be heaping up treasure in heaven. Don't miss that phrase at the end of verse 3. He's condemning those who reap, excuse me, who heap up treasure in the last days. No. If there's any heaping up for us to be doing, we should be heaping up treasure in heaven by having generous hearts. Listen, this is God's antidote to the selfish rich. It's generosity of heart to to give away things, to, to, to be those who store up treasure in heaven by wise and generous investment in the kingdom work of God. Now, He's going to continue on his very strong words, continuing on in verse 4. So let me read verses 4, 5, and 6. Here we go. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. 
You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Well, again, James very much speaking in the style of an Old Testament prophet. Here, he's envisioning the outcry of those who have been victimized by this unjust rich person that he spoke to in verses 1, 2, and 3. And what is it? What's the cry that goes out against him? Well, look here at verse 4. The wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. You see, one of the problems with these rich people that James condemns in verses 1, 2, and 3 and continues to speak about in verses 4 and following One of their sins was that they lived indulgently without regard to others. Do you remember the story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 16 about the rich man and Lazarus? Now, I call it a story because sort of against popular or maybe I say majority opinion, I regard that as not a parable, but a story that Jesus actually recounts about a rich man who had everything and lived very indulgently. And then a poor man named Lazarus who begged at his gate, and the poor man died and went to uh, uh, eternal bliss in the world to come. The rich man went to a place of torment and suffering. Why? Well, for probably several reasons, but one of them among them was that he was absolutely indifferent to the plight, to the suffering of the poor man right outside his gate. Now, For those people who condemn and murder from a position of power, God has judgment for them. Why? Because again, look at verse 4. The cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Seboeth. The, The idea here is that God hears the cry of the poor when they cry out against the oppression of the rich. When the rich oppress the poor, and the poor cry out to God, God hears. Now listen, I know sometimes we think, well, then why doesn't God respond? Why is it still that the rich can continue on in impression of the poor? Well, I'll tell you, we just have to understand and accept that there are some things that will not be settled until God settles them in eternity. That's just the fact. We can protest again. Well, no, it's not fair. We wish it was different. Listen, maybe we do wish it was different. But that's the fact that, that there are things that will not make sense in this world until they are settled in the light of eternity. Now, we don't say that to say that we should not have a concern for setting right whatever we can set right in this earth. No, of course. We don't shut down the courts of justice saying, well, God will settle it in the end. No, we endeavor to do whatever we can right now to accomplish justice and to express God's will in that way in the here and now. But we understand that that man's systems of justice, that man's structures and, and the society around us, it is ultimately not going to settle everything. We have to wait until God perfectly and finally settles everything in the age to come. And who's going to do it? Notice again, verse 4. The cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Seboeth. I want you to look carefully at the phrasing of verse 4. He uses a title there, Lord of Seboeth. Most every time when I've read the Bible, I automatically think that the title there that's being used is Lord of the Sabbath. That's a title that's used for God in Mark chapter 2, verse 28 and Luke chapter 6, verse 5. It's not the Lord of the Sabbath. No, this is the Lord of Seboeth. The translation of this is a translation of the idea behind the word or the phrase in Hebrew, Lord of hosts. You can find comparable phrases in uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 29, and Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. It's a expression of the Old Testament idea, Lord of hosts. And do you know what Lord of hosts mean? When we hear that phrase, sometimes we think of uh, someone who is a host for guests coming over their house. And we think Lord of hosts, well, he's the Lord of those who receive guests. Well, no, that's not the idea at all. The Old Testament phrase, Lord of hosts, refers to the Lord of armies. 
the God who commands, especially angelic armies. He is the commander in chief of angelic armies. It's a military term. And the idea here is that God is a warrior. He is, as I said before, the commander in chief of heavenly armies. That's the God that you are offending. That's the God that you are um, uh, storing up judgment in the account of when you when you oppress the poor in this way. That's meant to be a sobering idea. See, the cries of the people that they had oppressed, it comes to the ears of the God who commands heavenly armies, the God of all might and power and judgment. Again, it's meant to be a wake-up call. And that's why he says the thing is so serious that he says here in verse 6, you have condemned, you've murdered the just, he does not resist you. Now again, as I said before, often those who are poor and without power in this world have little satisfaction from human institutions of justice. Nevertheless, God hears their cries and God is the one who guarantees that he will ultimately right every wrong and he will answer every injustice. This is the promise of God. Now, when he says you have condemned, you have murdered the just, we understand that, again, in the style of the Old Testament prophets, which these um, six verses that begin James chapter 5 are very much written in that style. In the style of the Old Testament prophets, he's speaking with some uh, poetic exaggeration. Now, there is no doubt that it is sometimes literally true that the oppression of the powerful, the oppression of the rich over the poor, sometimes does lead to murder. But, but it doesn't have to lead to murder to be noticed by God and ultimately condemned by God. So again, this is a heavy phrase, a heavy idea. God will set these things right. Now, in light of the fact that God will set these things right, those of us who do have resources, those of us who do have uh, some measure of wealth in this world, we need to be very careful that we do not use it to oppress other people, that we use it to do good in this world, that we use it generously, and most importantly, that we do not allow our hearts to be wedded or welded to the things of this world, but we keep a light touch. And I'm not saying it's the only way, but one of the important ways that we keep a light touch on the things of this world is by having hearts of generosity towards God and the work of his kingdom. Now, starting in verse 7, he's going to give a call for patient endurance in light of the coming judgment. In other words, in the verse 6 verses, he's introduced the idea that judgment is coming. There's no doubt about that. So in light of that, what kind of attitude should we have, especially those of us who may be on the scale of being poor or, or we don't have all the power that other people have? How should we be? Look at verses 7 and 8. It'll introduce this idea. He says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. You see, James brings forth the idea in the previous verses of the ultimate judgment to come. Now he's calling Christians, especially those Christians who are enduring hardship, he tells them to patiently endure until the coming of the Lord. I've got to say, I find it fascinating that James is not trying to incite a class war. He doesn't say, hey, you've been oppressed by the rich. Hey, hey you, you, you're out of power? Then have a class war. Fight after those things. You know, despise the rich and go get them. No, he advises us to have a patient endurance for the ultimate justice of God. Now, again, I want to stress, this doesn't mean that we do away with our attempts to do the best we can on a human level with justice. No, we do what we can, but again, we do it all with the ultimate realization that there is only going to be ultimate and perfect judgment in 
the reckoning that God will bring in the age to come. Until then, we've got to be patient. Now, again, I'm not saying a patience that has uh, complete inactivity, that gives up on trying to work towards uh, what's right and good in the present age. But ultimately, we have to have the patience that James speaks about in verse 7. Look at where he says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently. You see, the farmer doesn't give up when the crop doesn't come right away. He keeps working. Can you imagine a farmer? He, he plants wheat out in the field. He comes back the next day or let's say two days later. He goes, where's the wheat? It hasn't come up yet. Well, I'm going to dig all this up. I guess it's not working. No, the farmer doesn't do that. The farmer says, look, if I want a harvest, I have to wait patiently until the crop grows. And that farmer keeps on working even when the crop can't be seen. Even so, Christians must work hard and exercise patient endurance even when the harvest day seems far away. We need to wait upon God and not lose heart along the way. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently. I want you to understand and appreciate how many victories are won by patience and persistence. There's a lot in this world accomplished by patience and persistence. Sometimes uh, evil things are accomplished in this world just because the people who are propagating those evil things have the patience to keep working on them over many, many years. No, a lot is done sometimes for good, sometimes for evil, through patience, through persistence. And we need to have patience and persistence, especially as believers in light of who God is. I like what Charles Spurgeon said about this. He said this, quote, I never reckoned that I was to slay my enemy at the first blow. I never imagined that I was to capture the city as soon as I had ever digged the first trench. I reckoned upon waiting. And now that has come, I find that God gives me the grace to fight on and to wrestle on till the victory shall come. And patience saves a man from a great deal of haste and foolishness. Again, what a great quote from Charles Spurgeon. And when we think about it, the attitude that we should have in this world, the attitude of endurance that we should have as believers, it's very much like the waiting that a farmer needs to do. I mean, think about it. The, the, the farmer waits a long time for the crop to come, doesn't he? Now, he waits with a reasonable hope and expectation of reward. The, the farmer's not crazy. He's not just throwing rocks into the ground and figuring that wheat is going to grow from it. No, he has a reasonable hope, a reasonable expectation of reward. And while he waits, the farmer works. You better believe he works. He's watering. He's weeding. He's fertilizing. He's caring. And he waits while he depends on things that are out of his power. I mean, he looks to the heavens. He looks to the heavens to see what the weather is going to be like. Because again, he waits expectantly waiting on things that are out of his control. That farmer has to wait despite changing circumstances, despite many uncertainties. But he waits because he's encouraged knowing the harvest that comes forth, it's going to be valuable. I'll tell you another reason why the farmer waits. He has no other option. It's not within his power to do it any quicker. And so why does he wait? Because he has to. He waits because it'll do him no good to give up. And he waits because as time goes on, it becomes more important for him to wait and not less important. Listen, in all these, give us reasons for us to wait and describe for us the kind of way that we should wait for God's resolution of all things. Now, I'm going to say it probably for the fourth or fifth time during this study because I want it to be clear. We're not saying that we don't care about advancing things with human institutions of justice and righteousness in this present world. No, we do. But we do it without having an ultimate hope that any of those things are going to be perfected. This perfect justice is going to happen in the age to come. Matter of fact, the waiting should happen, verse 7, until the earth receives the early and the latter rain. You see, James intends that literally. 
He's referring to the early rains that come and water the area that we would call Israel today, the early rains and the latter rains that come in April or May. All of those things are essential for the crops to grow. There's no allegorical picture here of an early and latter outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church. Now, look, I I do believe that the Bible teaches that there will be a significant outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days, but that's not what James is talking about here. No, not at all. No, again, verse 8, he's saying that we, as just the farmer waits for the early and latter rains, we should, in verse 8, establish our hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand hand. Listen, Jesus is coming soon. We have the expectation of reward and fulfilled justice so we can establish our hearts in hope of the return of the Lord. I want you to see something that's fascinating to me, that this letter of James being written early in the, uh, um, in the calendar of when letters were written, when the New Testament books, it had the expectation of the return of Jesus. And I don't think James was wrong to have that expectation. So some people look back on this expectation of Jesus' return that James reflects here and that Paul reflects in many of his letters and that Jesus told us to have in the Gospels. And they say, see, they were all wrong. Because James said the coming of the Lord was at hand. That means like as close as your hand. James said the coming of the Lord is at hand. And apparently it wasn't at hand because Jesus hasn't returned for 2,000 years. No, I'm going to disagree with you there. James knew, Paul knew, and especially Jesus knew and told us that every generation of Christians should live with the expectation of the return of Jesus Christ. This is a good thing and not a bad thing. We live with the expectation that Jesus is coming soon and that he will bring the reward that we have patiently waited for with him. That's why he says, the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now on to verse 9. Verse 9 is interesting to me. You know, he's been talking about this patient endurance that we should have, sometimes in light of evident injustice that we see around us. James also adds here, verse 9, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. What's the connection here? Again, I, I think it's just simply this. When we experience times of hardship, times of at least perceived injustice, that can make us less than loving with our Christian brothers and sisters. So James tells us, listen, even when you're going through hardship, even when you feel like you're experiencing injustice, don't become a grumbler or a complainer. Why? Well, because you don't want to be condemned with the judge standing at the door. Jesus is coming, and one of the offices Jesus will return in is the office of judge. Jesus is going to come not only to judge the world, that's true, but don't forget what 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 tells us, that Jesus will also come to judge the faithfulness of Christians. And if our lives have been filled with grumbling and complaining, don't you think Jesus will have every right to come back to us and essentially say, why didn't you trust me? You, You could have trusted me in that situation and you didn't. Why didn't you trust me? Why didn't you believe me that I could and would work even in this difficult situation? All right, now, verses 10 and 11. Again, continuing on in the theme of patient endurance, even in light of hardship, he says this, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So sometimes we need examples to kind of show us, number one, that other people have endured hardship, and so God working in our life, we can as well. But but then also examples just so we can know, maybe follow something from their example. So he says there in verse 10, take the prophet's, as an example of suffering and patience. James reminds us that the Old Testament prophets endured hardship, 
yet they practiced patient endurance. And again, we can take them, as James says, as an example. You know, one example that you can think of among these Old Testament prophets, how about Jeremiah? He was put in the stocks, something torturous seen in Jeremiah chapter 20. He was thrown into prison in Jeremiah chapter 32. He was lowered into a miry dungeon in Jeremiah chapter 28, yet he persisted in his faithfulness and his work before God. We, God helping us, can follow his example. But Jeremiah is not the only one. There's another one that James mentions in verse 11. And I find James chapter 5, verse 11 fascinating because it is the only New Testament mention of a great Old Testament figure, this man, Job. He's not mentioned anywhere else in the, Old Te- in the New Testament, I should say. Look at what he says here in verse 11. He says, You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. See, James essentially tells us three things about Job and how those things can be a significant example for Christians in times of suffering and hardship. Here's three things about Job that he tells us. Number one, we see the perseverance of Job. Well, Job did show tremendous perseverance, didn't he? I mean, Job lost everything under attack from Satan. And even though he lost everything, he did not curse God. He did not deny God. He he refused to turn his back on God despite his severe, and may I say, his mysterious suffering. Because Job didn't know why this suffering came upon him. Only we know when we read the book of Job because we see behind the scenes what God was doing. But we also see in the book of Job, not only the perseverance of Job, but we also see, this is again verse 11, the end intended by the Lord. What does he mean by the end intended by the Lord? He's speaking of the ultimate goal and purpose of God in allowing this suffering to come upon Job. You know, the greatest purpose or end intended by the Lord in the suffering of Job was that he would be a lesson to angelic beings. That's in a sense what the whole book of Job is about. God said, I'm going to use this man, Job, and I'm going to use him and his life and his responses to what I allow to come into his life. I'm going to use this man to teach angelic beings. I want you to think about something. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, God says that he is using the church, his people today, you and me. He's using us to also teach angelic beings. And when we understand that God has a good purpose in these things, then even painful things are put into a proper perspective. I like an example that Charles Spurgeon used on this point. He said, What am I going to think if a man comes to me with a knife? Spurgeon said, well, it depends. It depends on the circumstances. If it's some thief or murderous attacker, I'm going to fear when that man comes to me with a knife. But if it's a surgeon whose purpose is to do good in my life, then when the surgeon comes to me with a knife, I know his purpose is good and I'm okay with it. In the same way, When we see God allowing hardship in our life, directing it towards his eternal purpose, when we see the end intended by the Lord, we can say, okay, Lord, it's a little bit scary that you're allowing this, but I know that the purpose is good and I don't need to fear it. So again, what's the three things he shows us in verse 11? First, the perseverance of Job. Secondly, the end or the purpose intended by the Lord. And then finally, that the Lord, this is number three, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And I'm going to be straight with you. This is not immediately apparent in the story of Job. We can quickly think that God was cruel to Job, treating Job as if he was something like a laboratory rat, I'm going to make him run around in my maze so that I can test him and, 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 and trouble him, uh, but for my greater purposes. No, 
when we take a look at the book of Job and the whole story of Job in greater perspective, we see that it is indeed true that the Lord was very compassionate and merciful upon Job. And let me give you just at least four reasons. I could give you more, but let me give you four reasons why Job demonstrates that God was very compassionate and merciful. Number one, God was very compassionate and merciful to Job because he only allowed the suffering to Job for a very good reason. Brothers and sisters, if God allows hardship in your life, it's for a good reason. God is not going to do it for a frivolous or a, a irrelevant reason. No, it's going to be a good reason. Even if you can't see that good reason, God has one. Secondly, God was very compassionate and merciful to Job because he restricted what Satan could do against Job. Now, I'm not going to get into the details, but what Satan did against Job was terrible. Job lost so much when God gave permission to Satan to stretch out his hand against Job. Job lost so much, but I want you to understand something. As bad as what Job suffered, Satan wanted to do more, and God put a restriction. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand, God sets a limit to what the devil can do against you. And as tough as it might seem right now, if you feel like you're under fearsome spiritual attack, I want you to understand that the devil wishes he could do worse against you. But God has said, no, stop. You can do no further than this against my child. Here's the third reason. God was very compassionate and merciful to Job because God sustained Job with his unseen hand throughout all of Job's suffering. What do I mean by that? Well, listen, I know I'm, I'm taking part of this by implication, but, but you can't read the book of Job without understanding, even though you're not going to read these exact words in the book of Job, but it's in a sense written between every line almost of the book of Job, that God sustained Job with his strength, with his invisible hand throughout Job's suffering. There is no way that Job could have endured and made it through the end of what happened. There's no way that Job could have done it if God did not sustain him. It's almost as if God challenged Satan along these lines. He said, okay, Satan, look, you, you do your worst against Job and I'm going to do my best in him. And you know what won out? Not the worst that Satan wanted to do against him, but the best that God ordained. And then finally, I'll say this, that God was very compassionate and merciful to Job because in the end, God used Satan himself what do I mean by that? Well, at the end of it all, Job was a better and a more blessed man. And God used the attacks of Satan to bring greater blessing and greater godliness into Job's life. I mean, think about it. At the beginning of the book of Job, Job's a blessed man and he is a good man. At the end of the book of Job, he's more blessed and he's a better man. And God used the attacks that Satan intended to destroy Job. God used them. And this was a demonstration of the compassion and the mercy of God. No, brothers and sisters, we can understand these three things that in the story of Job, it shows us the perseverance of Job. It shows us the end or the purpose intended by the Lord. And also it shows us that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Now, we're going to conclude our time here together with this particular study with a look at verse 12. He says here, But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Again, this is one of those verses where we can say, it sure shows that James knew the Sermon on the Mount because this repeats themes that Jesus spoke of in the Sermon on the Mount, especially in Matthew chapter 5, verses 34 through 37, about not swearing, about letting your yes be yes and your no be no. Now, in James's day, many Jewish people uh, made distinctions 
between what they called a binding oath and a non-binding oath. And what was the difference between a binding oath and a non-binding oath? Here was the difference. A binding oath included the name of God in the oath. A non-binding oath did not include the name of God. And when you made a non-binding oath, it was a way, you know, this is something that we'd speak about in American culture, of making a promise with your fingers crossed behind your back. I, I don't know if that's even relevant to other cultures. But in American culture, when I was a kid, if you made a promise to somebody with your fingers crossed behind your back, it was a way of saying, I'm saying something, but I'm giving myself permission to lie. In the Jewish culture of James's day, there was a way to make an oath, which actually you thought you were giving yourself permission to lie. James says, be done with all of that. Don't, don't make oaths like that. Now, we've got to say this. The Bible does not forbid the swearing of all oaths, only against the swearing of deceptive oaths, unwise oaths, or, or flippant oaths. How do I say that God does not forbid the swearing of all oaths? Because on occasion, God himself swears an oath. Look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 73. It's an expression of God swearing an oath. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 11. It's an expression of God swearing an oath. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. No, there are places where God himself swears an oath. And so by the principle of non-contradiction, we understand that when God speaks so strongly against the swearing of oaths, he's referring to these deceptive oaths, these unwise oaths, these flippant oaths, these oaths that were really tricks where it was believed that it gave the person permission to actually tell a lie in the clothing of an oath or a swearing. So he says, Do not swear either by heaven or earth or any other oath, but what? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Look, just be an honest person. <laughs> Don't be the kind of person who has to kind of dress up your supposed truth with oath upon oath. No, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Why? lest you fall into judgment. You know, Jesus said something again that just kind of sobers us in this regard. Jesus told us that every idle word we speak will be remembered before God. And so we shouldn't be flippant. No, God is looking at what we say. God is looking at what we do. Now, what does my knowledge of God looking at what I say. What does my knowledge of this judgment that James speaks about, what does it lead me to? Well, number one, it leads me, first and foremost, it leads me to say, I need a savior in Jesus Christ because I've failed. I've made promises that I haven't kept. I've made oaths that I haven't fulfilled. I've made a sworn oath when I should not have made it. I have sinned in these areas. Have you? Well, then you and I we need a Savior, Jesus Christ. This awakens us to our need for a Savior. That's number one. But then number two, it says, God helping me, help my yes to be yes and my no to be no. You see, these oaths that we sometimes swear, these deceptive promises, do they not demonstrate a lack of patient endurance? I'm trying to game the system. I'm trying to gain some advantage. I'm trying to do something. I'm trying to manipulate God. I'm trying to manipulate another person by my swearing. The... No, let's be done with all of that. Let's have the patient endurance that James tells us to have. We won't need to swear unwise oaths. We won't need to make promises that we can't keep. But God helping us, we will find that patient endurance that we've seen in many Old Testament figures that James talked about, but most of all, we see in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Next time, we're going to conclude this book of James, starting at James chapter 5, verse 13. Until then, may God really work in us the patient endurance that we actually need.